was trying to get jobs. I was trying to reach out to different workforce programs. And I, I can't thank you enough. Just saying, that's about as gangster as I get. Thank you. Thank you, Jason Moore, for the borrowing of the hat. I forgot to inform the team that I was coming out at the last minute, so they've been out looking all over for me. So, hey, our goal this month in the month of August is to have fun. Does anybody else want to have fun in life? Can you have fun in church? It's not an oxymoron. Some church members may appear like morons, but it's not an oxymoron to have fun in church. So we're here this month having a blast together. We are living a full and a whole life. You know that the, the path that is narrow, right, isn't as narrow as you think. Because when God's in it, it's everything. So this month we are engaging the culture and having fun. Perry Ann did such a great job last week setting up this whole playlist series that we're doing through Labor Day. And she talked about not only our opportunity to engage the culture, but rather our responsibility to engage the culture. That we are the church, the local church is the hope of the world. The local church is the only hope for the world. And so if we're not real and we're not engaging them, how many of you realize who is? The enemy has captivated them, but we're called to engage them and lead them out of captivity into liberty. And we're here this month taking a look at a couple of songs, a couple of fun songs, and there's different ways to relate to the culture. Sometimes we might relate to it pointing out some, some critique and some perspectives, which Perian did last week. Sometimes we might just look at the culture and say, they got it right from here to here, but they still need to go from, from here to there. And we can fill in the gaps because Jesus, because Perry Ann said it so well last week, Jesus is the desire of the nations. He is the fulfillment of everything the world is looking for. They're looking for love in all the wrong places. I just want to break out into song lyrics. Some of them would be older than Drake, I'm just saying. So my assignment today in a very short period of time before we have lunch together, because today's a day of celebration, is just to celebrate some truth and some mission and assignment from God for us that I think that Drake touches on. I think he's dancing, dancing around the outskirts, if you will, around the fringes of something that God has a dream to accomplish through his local church. So let me just unpack a little bit of history about the song because this song is like gone viral. It's redefined what gone viral means. I mean, it has gone big fast. So the song God's Plan by Drake was released on January 19th of this year. It became the 29th song in history to debut at number one on US, U.S. Billboard Hot 100. So the day it came out, it started at number one. The song became an international success, reaching number one in Australia, Denmark, Germany, Greece, Ireland, Italy, the Netherlands, New Zealand, Norway, Portugal, Sweden, as well as the top 10 in Austria, Belgium, Czech Republic, Finland, 
France, Lebanon, Scotland, Spain, and Switzerland. I think the gospel needs to be number one. And I think there is actually some, a seed of truth here that makes it so appealing. So it also debuted at number one in Canada and on the UK singles chart on January 26th. The song launched with the largest on-demand streaming count in history, breaking Apple's first day streaming record upon release with 14. 15 million streams and breaking Spotify's single day streaming record with 4.3 million plays in 24 hours. That's a lot, folks. The song was streamed 82.4 million times in the first week. Its music video received five nominations at the 2018 MTV Movie uh, Video Music Awards, including the video of the year. It actually won the BET video of the year this year. The video depicts, as you just saw, Drake engaging in various acts of charity in Miami. The video's opening states that its entire budget of $996,631.90, and I want to give the other $309.10 to make it a million. <laughs> Nothing should stop that short of a million. <laughs> that they spent that total budget had been given away. At the campus of the University of Miami, Drake presented Destiny James, a young woman raised by a single mother in South Carolina, with a $50,000 check for tuition fees for a master's degree in public health. Isn't that amazing? And you saw him in the grocery store. You saw him in different outreach programs, different schools. Before the song came out, Drake tweeted, I don't know how many followers he has, but he tweeted about the song that was about to be released in January, that it was the song of his life. It was his dream about his purpose and what he wants to do with life. I think that that is really key. You know, one of the most asked questions that we get in church is this. How do I know what the will of God is for my life? How do I know what the plan of God is for my life? People want to know the plan and the will of God more than anything else. Or we could say people struggle over not knowing. People struggle trying to know the plan of God over their, for their life more than anything else. Because if they think they can get the right plan, if they can get the right will, that will guarantee their success. But I want to share with you today something bigger than a plan, and that is purpose. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. Most everybody knows this passage of Scripture. We quote it many, many times. And so it's very familiar in the, in the church, at least in America. And it says this, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. So we know that he has plans for us, right? Thank you. Thank you. We know that he has plans for us. But when we actually look deeper at this passage and the context of this passage, who's he actually writing? Who is this prophetic message that Jeremiah is giving? Who's it given to? It's given to a people in captivity. It's given to a people that are exiled, that are displaced. They're not in their home. They are actually serving under an oppressor. And he's saying to, the, to them, this is not my plan for you. It's not my plan that you would be in poverty. It's not my plan that you would be oppressed. It's not my plan that you would live under the rule of somebody else. I know my plans for you. My plans for you are good plans. So let me just say it this way. The circumstances that you may be in today do not define you. And they do not define God's plan for your life. 
His plan for your life are bigger than the circumstances that you're currently facing. It's bigger than the challenges. It's bigger than how much money you owe. He's telling them, your situation is not my assignment for you. My plan is to prosper you. My plan for you is bigger than where you're living today. And he says it's a hope and a future. There's something bigger than you've been able to imagine. What's amazing is that Drake himself grew up in Toronto, in Canada. This is very interesting. He was the son of a... English teacher, a, his mom is black, and an English teacher in the school system in Toronto. His dad was the drummer for Jerry Lee Lewis. <laughs> the problem was, yes, his mom and dad met while Jerry Lee Lewis was on tour in Toronto. The problem was <laughs> that his dad was ad addicted to drugs. And when he was living in Memphis, he had too many, what would you say? He got thrown in jail. He had too many situations where he ended up incarcerated for most of Drake's life, never sent money for his raising. So Drake was raised by a single mom. Can you see how that shows up in the video? And how he wants to help single moms. And how he gives a $50,000 scholarship to someone that was raised by a single mom. Because he knows the struggle is real. Because he's been there. He's lived through that. And so he has a context of what it means to grow up, if you will, impoverished and oppressed. And yet he's come out. Actually, Wikipedia says that his current worth is estimated, because you can't exactly calculate it, is estimated around $100 million. Not bad from a kid, for a kid who was raised by a single mom in poverty in Toronto. And now we're seeing a little bit of what he wants to do with that wealth. So, Jeremiah 29.11 it tells us this, in, in the King James, it says, I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. So I want to tell you this, that plans are practical, aren't they? They're concrete. In the actual Hebrew, the word there is not plans, it's thoughts, or the Hebrew word is machashaba. Everybody say out loud together. Machashaba, you did really well on that. <laughs> and it literally means thoughts, intentions, or I love this, designs, devices, dreams, or imaginations. It's translated other places as purpose. So the purpose of God, the dream of God, is bigger than any one plan. So he doesn't just have one plan for your life. He has a dream for your life. He is constantly imagining a better life for you. And that dream has many plans. It has many different ways that it can work out or many different routes that it can take to accomplish that dream and that purpose. Anybody else have the app Ways on your phone? I love the app Ways because if you're if you're if you don't know it, it's basically it's a traffic app. So if you're driving from de from point A to point B, and there comes a traffic jam, a wreck, or something in between point A and point B, and you're on that on that route, Ways will notify you of the traffic ahead, and it will reroute you through a different plan to get to the same end. It's intuitive, it's interactive, and it's bigger than any one plan to get from here to there. If ways can do that, do you not think that our God can do that? 
Or do you not think that if you veer off course and get off of the original quote-unquote plan or the original route that you had calculated into your own spiritual GPS and you maybe made some wrong decisions and some bad choices and you got off track? Do you not think that your God can get you back to the right destination from that point that you got off at? Let me tell you, he can. He can. He's better than ways. He'll recalculate the route. There is a thing in GPS that used to be known as the go-to button. Because when you're traveling, like on, a, on an airplane, if you're traveling long distance, 10,000 miles, you know, from here to London, there's going to be natural drift due to wind currents and everything, right? And so you have a GPS that charts your course from here to there. But because of drift, you drift a degree or two off course. You get down about four or 5,000 miles, and that's a fair amount of distance off course. But guess what? Your GPS is equipped with the go-to button. You push the go-to button, and it readjusts your course to always guarantee that you end up at the right destination. Somebody say amen or oh me. Wow. If you stay in right relationship with him, with your ear to the spirit, he has a go-to button that will always readjust you to get you to the right destination. It's not about perfect performance. It's really about staying in relationship. So a better question than what is the will of God or what is the plan of God for my life is what is God's purpose? What is God's dream to accomplish through my life? What difference does he want to make? Do you see that a plan and a will is really about a master and a slave relationship? But a dream and a purpose is about a father-son, a family relationship that we're working together in the family business and that we can make adjustments as long as we're in relationship with one another. Somebody say amen. amen. Let me just say personally, when in 1986, when we were faced with a decision on whether to go away to South Carolina to work on a PhD program in medical science, doing research, looking for cures to cancer and cures to uh, leukemia and cures to different diseases. And we believe in God's healing power through all venues, through all ministry, including medical science. So we were at a decision-making crossroads where we were going to have to leave the local church, move to South Carolina, where our, our education was completely scholarshiped, paid for, um, living provided, to work on a Ph.D. for both Perry Ann and I. And we came to a place in our hearts and by the manifestation of the Holy Spirit and word uh, in tongues and a word of knowledge that we knew that the purpose of God in our life, we had a choice to make. We could follow God's healing power in medicine or we could follow God's healing power in ministry. And the word the Lord gave us was that this realm is good but will be limited for you. But this realm of ministry will have no limitation. You'll have an anointing without measure. You'll impact people's spirit, soul, and body, not just in their physical healing. So we said, yes, Lord, we will go the ministry route. That shifted and changed the course. So we had a purpose in our life to bring God's healing power that to, to our generation and to preach the gospel to our generation. And we made a decision that that purpose will be fulfilled in this route. And that's why we're here today. So I want to say to all of our young people that are going to college, all of our young people trying to make that decision, follow his heart, follow your purpose, and change the world with the gifts that he's given you, and you will ultimately end in the destination that he has called for you to end in, no matter which route you take. 
Let's talk a little bit more about God's dream. I have three main thoughts for you. That was thought number one. God has a purpose more than a plan for your life. Thought number two is God has a dream for the world that your purpose is a part of. That dream is to bless the world by blessing someone who will bless the world. Did you catch that? He wants to bless the world by blessing you so you could be his ambassador to bless the world. He gave this promise to Abram in Genesis chapter 12. The Lord had said to Abram, go from your country, go from your people, go from your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. And I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. That's God's dream. It's God's dream for Abram. It was God's dream for him. And it was God's dream for Abraham's seed, Jesus. And it's God's dream for you and for me today. It's God's dream for the Abbey. It's God's dream for every local church to bless them so that they can be a blessing to the world around them. God called Abram out of his situation, out from a family history of demonic worship. I don't, you know, we, we so spiritualized Abram. You know, we think of him as the father of faith. We don't realize he had a past life. His parents worshiped demons. The Chaldeans were demon worshipers. I don't know their whole situation. I don't know whether he was prosperous or impoverished, but I can tell you this, you don't usually get two prosperous worshiping demons. And God called him out of that situation for him to be the provider and the resource to bless him and so that he could make him a blessing to the nations. You know what's amazing about the song? Drake grew up in the most unique of situations. He is a black man that grew up in a Jewish home. Maybe that's more common in Toronto. I don't know. It's just not very common here. He went to a school, a private Jewish school growing up, a school of the arts. Can you see that maybe God had him on a trajectory for a purpose? And I don't know where Drake is in being aware of his purpose, but I can tell you he's in pursuit of it. I hope that he comes to a full awareness of it, that it's provided through Jesus as his Messiah. But can you see that he grew up knowing Genesis chapter 12? If you go to a private Jewish school, how many of you think that you might be aware of the blessing of God on the Jewish people and the purpose of God to be a blessing to the nations through the Jewish people? It is a core value to who they are. It is part of their oral history. It's part of what would be rehearsed in his life over and over again every day he went to school. He would be confronted with that sense of mission and purpose and now he's living that out in his life. It's even interesting that he has started with some of his friends. He's known as an entrepreneur because he started. He didn't, he didn't go just into the music industry. He started his own production company for the music that they are producing called Young Money Entertainment. I love that. Because to me, that just says I'm not owned by somebody else's money. I'm not dictated what somebody else is going to tell me to do, but we are going to choose to do and to fulfill the purpose that we sense we have because we have our own money. Let that sink in just a little bit. That might be a good reason to get out of debt. Because God wants control of your money. 
Why? Because it's through you and through your financial blessing that he wants to provide for the world. It's not the U.S. government's responsibility to provide for everyone. God wants to do it through the church. Tax-free, I'm just saying. I believe he grew up with an awareness in a Jewish home to the point that he even acknowledges, acknowledges it in the song. I don't know if you caught it. Sometimes I have a hard time understanding what he's saying. Just saying. So I, I can read lyrics. He says in, in one of his verses, God's plan. Oh, man, I'm tempted to really do it a disservice. I miss, I'm not hearing it, so I'll read it. God's plan, God's plan. I can't do this on my own. I, no, I. Someone watching this close, yep, close. What is he acknowledging? God is watching over him implementing this plan. God's watching what he does and the decision he makes and how he spends his money. It's God's plan. He can't do it on his own. In a few lines before that, he acknowledges his broskies. Yes, that is brothers. Speaking of Forty and Ole, and those are the co-writers with him. Those are the ones who produced it with him. He's saying, I can't do this alone. First of all, I have to have God, and secondly, I have to have my team. And the same thing is true, folks. We can't do it alone. Praise God for the opportunities that the churches work together in a community. I don't even care if everybody's motive's right. Let's just get her done. Let's just, let's just put up a, a unified front to bless the community and help those in the community that have need. That's why the Hazel Ministerial Alliance started the Community Caring Center, the Eagle Mountain Pregnancy Help Center. That's why we've reached out and Servolution has started and, and it's helping in homes in Hazel and it's doing community gardens. That's why we work together is because it's not about us alone. We need some broskies. So where are we at in God's plan? Galatians 3, 13 and 14, one of my favorite passages of scripture tells us this. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who, hang, who, hung, who is hung on a tree. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. Listen, he redeemed us from the curse of the law, not that we would receive the blessing of the law. Did you catch that? One would think he removed the curse of the law to get the blessing of the fulfilled law. No, it goes 430 years earlier and a broader scope than what the law covered. It gives us the blessing of Abraham. The blessing of Abraham is the promise of the Spirit that will make you rich and bless you so that you can be a blessing and, and, and meet the needs of the world. That's where we fit, is in expectation of the blessing, the hand of God, the blessing of God, the, the provision of God. The blessing of Abraham is now shared with the church to be God's plan to bless the world. And then the last thought today, can you believe it, only three thoughts. Just a lot of details in those, each one of those thoughts. The last thought is this. Anybody know what the chorus was? Bad things. It's a lot of bad things that they wishing and wishing and wishing and wishing. They wishing on me. I can't rap. <laughs> you got to have the...
I need auto-tune because I'm not in tune. Here's the chorus that he says it over and over. Bad things. It's a lot of bad things that they wishing and wishing and wishing and wishing they wishing on me. Bad things, a lot of bad things that they wishing and wishing and wishing and wishing they wishing on me. Yeah, I. I. I am a fool for Christ and a little for Drake's sake. <laughs> What's he saying? He's saying, I'm living a dream. I'm living a purpose. I can't do it alone. It's the plan of God. And yet, people hate me for it. People are wishing bad things on me. He goes to to bars in New York City and gets in altercations and fights with other rappers because they don't like his success and they don't like what he's doing with it. The nature of the world in which we live comes from the nature of its God, the devil. And the primary seed of that nature is jealousy. What drives that ambition of the world and of Satan is jealousy against God, who he is, his presence, his anointing, and his blessing. I don't know that there's any place that that's more evident than the hip-hop rap music industry culture that epitomizes territorialism and violence. But listen, Jesus warned us about it. In Mark chapter 10, verse 28 to 31, after the rich young ruler came to Jesus and said, good teacher, what, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus gives him the impossible task, only impossible for him. Is, he said, I fulfilled all the law since my youth. He said, okay, fine, great. Then go sell all your possessions and give it to the poor. And the rich young ruler did what? He went away sad because he had much riches. He didn't want to let go of the natural riches and follow Jesus. In response to that, observing that, Peter speaks up in that moment and he says, we've left everything to follow you. <laughs> Sounds like Peter. And the reality is it's true. Peter had a business. He wasn't sitting on the side of the pond with a fishing rod. He had a business. He had nets. Jesus borrowed his boat. Just put this together. Jesus borrowed his boat at the very first days of his ministry, launched out into the deep, and taught to the masses on the, on the shore in, from Peter's boat, right? And then he said, launch out into the deep and let your nets down on, onto the side. And Peter's like, we've been fishing all night and got nothing. And he said, nevertheless, it's the command, your command, it, your word, we'll do it. So they launched out. They let down their nets. They had so much fish come in that it, that it broke the nets. And they had to call their partners to come help them bring it in, right? Everybody remember that story? Remember Peter's response to that story? He said, he looked at the financial provision of Jesus. He looked at the blessing from God on his business. And he said, woe is me. I'm a, I'm a wicked man. And he repented. Left the business and followed the provider. And now we have this moment where he's looking at a rich young ruler who's unwilling to leave his business to follow and he reminds Jesus, I left it. <laughs> Do you remember who did leave? And now I've got nothing. Right? Don't be so super spiritual. This is Peter. He's going to say what he thinks. So he's like, I left it all 
to follow you, Jesus, and we ain't got nothing left. <laughs> now, listen to Jesus' response. Truly, I tell you, Jesus replied, no one has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields. What are fields? That's your business. No one's left. Fields for me and the gospel will fall to will fail to receive a hundred times as much as in this present age. In this present age. In this present age. You will not fail to receive a hundred times fold from God of his blessing and his riches in your lifetime. Why? So that you can be a distributor of the wealth of God. Instead of an accumulator of your own wealth, he wants to make you a distributor of his wealth. Yeah, somebody needs to say glory to God. He'll give you homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields, plural, businesses, plural. Wait for it. <laughs> Along with persecutions. And in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. So he promised the riches, but he also promised the persecutions. But the persecution doesn't come from him. The persecution comes from a jealous world who wants it for themselves. I just want to say it again, folks. God is looking for a people that he can bless that will use his blessing to change the world. And how does he know? It's what are you doing with what you have? Not are what you're hoping to do with what you'll get. Somebody say amen. amen. So this song is about Drake standing up for what he believes in. He said, even though they're wishing bad things on me, I'm going to do what I believe is right. In the face of persecution, I'm going to do the right thing. Even though it has backlash. From haters. Can you hear me today when I say never be ashamed of prosperity. But use your position and your provision to bless the world. Because he gives us prosperity with a purpose. And I'm thankful that Drake is on the fringes of that. You know there's no lack in the world. And Proverbs says the wealth of the wicked is laid up for the just. That's for the righteous. For those who will use it to bless the world. To change nations. To help the poor and the oppressed. I can't wait that as a church, we're able to give $50,000 scholarships. I can't wait for the day that we give a million dollars away in a year. There's been, there's been years as a church that we've given over 50% of our total budget and income to world missions. We've done that in a season when we had no debt. And it's a good cause to get out of debt so you can give more away. Amen. Right? And I believe we're going to get there again. Amen. We get there from where we are when we use what we have to be a blessing. And that's why we do missions. And that's why even today we don't want to... You know, uh, you, can, you, can make a, you can make a video of people that no one knows in Miami. In a local church, you may not want to do the exact same thing and make someone maybe feel uncomfortable, but 
today, before, before the end of the picnic, there's going to be about four or five families in this house that could use some extra help in this moment, in this season of getting back to school. So we've given an assignment to someone to go and slip them quietly a gift and to bless them as they get ready to go back to school. So I say that because we don't want to call them up front and we don't want people to feel sorry for them, but we do want to bless them. And I just want to say, I do that today because as the Lord has directed and because this is, this is something he's emphasizing. But I, it, it is a common practice for us. We do it a lot. Not just in-house. You would be surprised if I told you how many people stop by this property week in and week out and we bless them. But I want to do more. And I want to do more significant things that we together as broskies <laughs> can change the world. Right? Yeah. Amen. Stand up with me. Go ahead and give the Lord a hand clap. It's a good word. So we're going to do a couple of different things here. Um, Naomi, can you come to the keyboard? Is she here? She's coming. Thank you, Naomi. Give Naomi a big hand. Uh, now, Naomi, I want you to play Drake, God's Plan. No, I'm just kidding. I just thought I'd throw her that curveball. I'm going to invite our Abbey prayer partners. We have a prayer team that will pray with people to come down to the front and just be available. I want them to be available. If you're here today, and first and foremost, if you are not in a father-son, father-daughter relationship with the Lord, you heard great testimonies today from those that were baptized. He wants to be your daddy. He's your daddy first. He's not your judge first. And as a daddy, he sent his son to pay the penalty of everything we've done wrong and of everything that was wrong in our heart. Jesus paid that price so that we could enter into that right relationship with him as his son, as his daughter, and be accepted in the family of God and be regenerated, remade, born again into a brand new spiritual person with the life of God in us. There's no greater miracle than knowing that you're a new creature in Christ. So if anybody's here today, when we're dismissed in just a moment, I invite you to just make your way down to these prayer partners and they'd love to just pray with you and just lead you into the loving embrace of your Father God and experience that love and that regeneration making Jesus Lord of your life, okay? Awesome. Second question. If you're here today and you want God to use you to change the world and be a blessing, would you just raise your hand? Just keep it raised for a moment. And while you have it raised, I just want to pray a prayer blessing over you. It was the promise of the Spirit that was the blessing to Abraham. The Holy Spirit is the blessing that releases all the provision, the blessing of provision. So Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for your people, those that have a, that have, that have a desire to be used of you to bless the world, to be a distributor, a distributor of your wealth. Lord, I bless them today with the power of the Holy Spirit, not by natural might, not by natural power, but by your Spirit. Let your blessings flow to them and give them wisdom to direct your blessings to others. To know who to bless in Walmart, 
in Albertsons and Kroger's to know who to buy school supplies for in, in the middle of the day or who to just pay their bill at a, at a restaurant. Lord, we'll let it start with little things as seeds, but let it blossom into full provisions such as scholarships for 50,000 and centers that are community centers for 100,000 changing nations and missionaries being sent. Lord, that I, I, I believe and I declare that the day is coming where this church will give away over a million dollars in one given year to missions, to bless others, not to spend on ourselves. Let it be so. Say that out loud with me. Let it be so. In the name of Jesus, amen, amen. Give the Lord a praise offering. Hallelujah, somebody shout. Hallelujah. Our prayer partners are available. Is there any more instruction that needs to be given? Somebody come give instruction, Jeff. As far as I know, it works. Test one, two. What we're going to do is we're going to take this section of chairs out. I need two team captains. Who wants to do it? Two guys. Give me a, okay, you're it, you're one, and you're the other. Pick, I don't care which. One of you, make sure the chairs leave. The other one, go to the back and get the checkered tables. We're going to run three rows this way from the back wall up. So you get a crew, guys, to take the chairs out. But don't take them too far because we need to put them back around the tables. So... Well, we need to move them just sideways so we can get the tables in and then put them back in. And then you grab a crew and get the red checkered tables and line them up. And then whatever Tabitha told you on the food, I don't... Oh, never mind. I'm going to pass it off to someone better than me. We are almost ready to serve. If, again, if you can just go out these doors and form a line through the hallway. Um, and then later today, I didn't mention, we have face painting. We have balloon animals coming. We have um, games outside. They're a lot of fun in a photo booth and Cornhole and Connect Four and all of the fun things. Um, so if you guys can make your way out these doors and form a line, we'll open, um, just stand at the single door and we'll open it when we're ready for you. God bless you, you're dismissed.